If you're a fan of the grimdark universe known as Warhammer 40k, then I'm here to inform you that we have all been lied to. I'm talking about all those glorious pieces of artwork depicting the emperor of mankind. Look at the resplendent golden armor. Look at the chiseled jaw and perfect hair. Look at the muscularity. False. All of it is lies. As much as I want this golden pillar of radiant manliness to be real, sorry fellas, we've all been bamboozled. Across many of the different Horus Heresy books, the Emperor is described differently by different people. Whether he be a loving, strong father figure, or a logical, uncaring scientist. Whether he be similar in statue to you or I, or an 18 foot tall golden god of war. None of these are actually what the Emperor looks like. In this video, we're going to try to get to the bottom of one of 40k's greatest mysteries. What the Emperor of Mankind really looks like. And that's no easy task, as it's like the Emperor is constantly using a galaxy-spanning VPN or something. And speaking of VPNs, I want to give a shout out to this video's sponsor, Atlas VPN. How'd you like that? Absolutely nailed that transition. Anyways, after that, we're going to dive headfirst into the grimdark. Stay tuned. Atlas VPN is a virtual private network, which makes all of your internet traffic travel through a secure encrypted tunnel. By encrypting and hiding your virtual location, it protects you from all manner of threats on the internet, like people trying to steal your information through public Wi-Fi. And Atlas isn't just a VPN. It offers you an extra layer of protection by blocking malicious links and trackers while notifying you if someone is trying to steal your data. They're offering my viewers a massive discount for Black Friday, wherein you can get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.70 per month, plus six months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee by clicking the link down in the description of this video. But you'll have to be fast because it's a limited time offer. If you're an avid binger of streaming services like Netflix, HBO, or Hulu, Atlas VPN gives you access to shows that may not be available in your country, while additionally letting you watch all of your comfort shows when you travel abroad. Searching for something on Google? If you use Atlas VPN, you can do so without having your activity tracked. And all of your devices are protected and can be used simultaneously with a single subscription. And I think their coolest feature is that they can actually help you save money while shopping online. Now, many popular websites adjust their prices based on the region that you're in. And since Atlas VPN lets you change that, you can rest assured knowing that you're always getting the best price possible, no matter what it is you're trying to buy online. Click on the link in the description of this video to get some massive savings on Atlas VPN Premium for only $1.70 per month. Plus that six extra months with that 30 day money back guarantee. It's the best Atlas VPN offer of the year, so be quick. Big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. The Emperor of Mankind is one of the most interesting and complicated characters in any piece of modern fiction. He's an enigma wrapped in a mystery, bristling with inconceivable levels of psychic potential. He is one, if not the singular, most powerful living being in the entire 40k universe, one that the gods that dwell with the Immaterium rightfully fear. Despite his insistence that he has always just been a man, there is a mountain of evidence to suggest that he is in fact a god. Whether he became one after his entombment upon the Golden Throne, or he ascended to godhood after he stole power from the Chaos Gods on Molech, or that he simply was one all along, but played the role of a human being to suit his purposes and further his ultimate objectives, all of this remains intentionally unclear. But one thing that we can be absolutely certain of with the Emperor is that the one that we think we know doesn't exist. And I know that may be a little bit of an obvious statement considering he's a fictional character, but the same idea holds true in the lore 40k as well. As all of the artwork we have ever seen of the Emperor is a lie. In one way or another, the images we have been shown of this person are intentionally misleading, in that they convey not the Emperor's true self, but what the individual artist who created it believed the Emperor to be. And all of these depictions are based on what the Emperor wants you to think he is. It's super meta, but I find it kind of interesting that even the fan art of the Emperor is subjected to his deception. That the image we have in our mind is not actually the Emperor, but of the concept of the Emperor. One that he intentionally fabricated, all according to his great plan. The basic crux of this argument is that the Emperor's true form is a complete mystery. Nobody actually knows what he looks like. The figure they see is an illusion, a manifestation of his psychic will that takes the form of whatever entity will further his agenda. If he needs to appear as a 14 foot tall glowing god of war to instill fear in any that would stand in the way of his goals, then that is how a warlord of a non-compliant planet is going to see him. 
If he needs to appear humble and meek in order to blend into a crowd, you most likely wouldn't even notice his presence, even if he was standing right beside you. Over the course of this video, we're going to examine the accounts of three different characters on what the emperor actually appeared like to them as well as diving into two real-life interviews from authors that have written about the character for the Black Library in the past. Now, some elements remain true for each of these depictions, the long hair, ageless face, and an aura of authority. But the differences between all these accounts are much more interesting. But to kick it off, we're going to examine a quick passage from The Master of Mankind, where the Emperor is speaking to one of his custodians, Ra Endymion, and he asks him, When I speak to you, to others, Am I speaking aloud? Does my mouth move and form the shapes of human language? Does a human voice emerge? Or is it merely how mortal minds process my presence and my psychic will? On numerous occasions, the custodians had seen the emperor interact with humans on different worlds, uh, people that didn't speak high Gothic, and more often than not, spoke in a language that was unknown to anyone that was part of the Imperium. Languages that arose in the 10,000 years or so the planet had been completely isolated. Yet, without fail, the Emperor was able to speak in their tongue flawlessly. There's another interesting example of this from the novel Echoes of Eternity that details the Primarch Sanguinius's first meeting with his father. Now, the Emperor's ship had touched down on his homeworld, and Sanguinius had flown out to meet him. He had never seen a spaceship before, but noted that there was something vulturous about it. It didn't fly with grace, but with power. The first thing he saw was his custodians, armored in gold just like the ship. And he found it strange that a being that would call himself his father would need such guardians. Welcome to Balfora, Outlanders. He spoke Anakian, the tongue of his people, the pure. He wondered if the Outlanders would understand him or whether they would be forced to rely on hand gestures and awkward mimicry. My son, said one of the Golden Ones, as somehow speaking it silently. He felt his father's voice for the first time as one of his own thoughts, a sensation rather than speech, backed by a tremendous feeling of suppressed force. The golden man, if he was a man that sent the contact, seemed to be making significant efforts to restrain himself or to contain the power within. There was more there though. My son rhymed with my weapon and rhymed with the ninth and rhymed with other concepts that Sanguinius couldn't parse from the core of the man's meaning. A lifetime of perspective was bound up in that contact, and Sanguinius sensed only the gulf between his father's silent words and the meaning behind them. He felt no threat in the touch of mind upon mind. Confidence, impatience, love, caution, approximations of those were words couldn't quite convey the actuality. It was all in there. The man, and he did seem like a man, dark of skin and hair, smelling of metal and sweat, in possession of a heartbeat, walked closer. I am the Emperor, the man said, as he stepped out of the spacecraft's shadow, and I am your father. Father, the man had said, the word rhyming in silence with master, with shaper, with creator. Sanguinius met the Emperor's eyes. What he saw there, glinting in the light of his father's gaze, was the answer to a question he had never even considered. This being, this Emperor, was human, but he was not exactly a man. I see the light of many souls in your eyes, many men, many women. The Emperor smiled. Is that what you see? He spoke flawless Anakian, but the perfection was itself a flaw. He spoke the tongue with the same dialect and inflection as Sanguinius himself. Either the Emperor was pulling the meaning from the angel's mind or imprinting meaning upon it. Whichever was true, he wasn't really speaking the language at all, nor was Sanguinius entirely certain that he could see the man's mouth move. What am I? He asked. You are my son, said the emperor. And again, the meanings and concepts danced beneath those words. You are my son was overlaid by you are a primarch and you are my ninth general and you are a component of the great work and you were stolen by the enemy. And most unsettling of all, you may have been changed by them. I don't know what you mean. You will, the emperor assured him. Now compare this powerful description of a meeting with the Emperor by one of his sons to that of Ark and Land, a member of the Mechanicum that is famous for having invented the Land Raider, as well as the grav treads on the custodian's bikes and vehicles. Do not bow, the Emperor had said. His voice was as machine-like and pure as Arkin had imagined, devoid of all tone and emphasis. Such monotone purity usually only came with significant augmentation. Arkin rose as instructed. He didn't see a warlord as many had claimed to see. He saw a scientist, 
gone was the armor of the brazen Terran conqueror, replaced by a protective hazard suit, suitable for work in sterile and hostile conditions alike. In this scene, the Emperor has called Arkan Land to one of his laboratories to seek his advice, a unheard of honor for Land. The Emperor has Angron unconscious on a surgical table and has been operating on his brain to better understand the device known as the Butcher's Nails that have been implemented into him. At no point does he ever refer to him by his name or as his son. Angron is simply the 12th. In fact, all of the Primarchs are referred to only by their numbers. There's a cold, uncaring, logical nature about the way he speaks with Land, which is the complete opposite from all other noted accounts between the Emperor and members outside of the Mechanicum. Arkin had expected the Omnissiah's dispassionate demeanor, but to witness it in so intimate a context was inspiring in the extreme. So neutral, so inhumanly neutral. Divine one, he said, before he knew he was going to say anything at all. Land hesitated. You are more sanguine than I would have imagined in this moment, even knowing of your holy detachment from emotion. What would the alternative be? That I might mourn the twelfth? as though it were my injured son and I its grieving father. Never that, divine one, though some might expect it. It is not my son, Arkin. None of them are. They are warlords, generals, tools bred to serve a purpose, just as the legions were bred to serve a purpose. The Primarchs, it is said they have always called you father. It seems so sentimental. I've never understood why you allow it. There was once a writer, he said, a penner of children's stories who told the tale of a wooden puppet that wished to be reborn as a human child. And this puppet, this automaton of painted carved wood that sought to be a thing of flesh and blood and bone. Do you know what it called its maker? What would such a creature call the creator that gave it shape and form and life? Father. Arkin felt his skin crawl. A high understand, divine one. Okay, so let's compare these two different encounters. With Sanguinius, there is so much weight and emotion behind every syllable that the Emperor speaks, concepts and themes so great that they would take an eternity to fully explain. Yet, they are there, their meaning interwoven with his words. There is emotion and nuance. He appears as an inspiring leader and a loving father at the same time, despite the enormous amount of weight and layered meaning behind each of his words. Their gravitas is observed without question, even if even for a Primarch, the gulf of their meaning cannot be fully understood. Exactly what one would expect from the father of the Primarchs. But with a member of the Mechanicum, monotonous purity, void of all emotion, one who only refers to his children as numbers and sees them as little more than tools to be used and discarded. Exactly what a techno-archaeologist such as Land would expect from the Avatar of the Machine God. Two completely different individuals seeing a completely different Emperor. It's honestly kind of fascinating. So we know that the Emperor is able to imprint on the minds of anybody he comes into contact with. When he speaks, all those who hear him hear exactly what he needs them to hear in order to fall in line with his plans. And this isn't limited to just literal words, as there is so much more to speech. The way one structures a sentence, the inflection they use, their body language, all of these things are manipulated in a person's mind to present the image of perfection and absolute authority. It's neither here nor there, and it admittedly might not be a super relevant point, and I considered cutting it out of my script, but when I learned about this, I thought that it was very interesting that this is also exactly how demons of Slanesh operate, appearing to you as the most beautiful person you could imagine, and speaking in such an alluring way that they can manipulate you down the path of damnation. It's almost like the Emperor is doing the exact same thing, but with the ultimate goal of compliance and order, rather than unrelenting hedonism. What's really interesting about this is that even a species like the Eldar doesn't have a real concise view of who or what the Emperor actually is, as there's an Eldari in the novel Godblight that mentions to the Eldar the Emperor has always been chameleonic, and that when trying to view his futures, all possible paths tend to burn away, and that try as hard as they might, the Eldar can't look on him or his futures directly, that he is a completely unknowable entity. 
It's actually a great shame that the Necrons were still asleep in their tomb worlds at the time of the Great Crusade, with the exception of Trazen, who I don't think ever interacted with him, and the Silent King that was outside of the Milky Way at the time, as it would be really interesting to hear what they experienced when talking to the Emperor, considering that they're little more than an Ingram copy of consciousness downloaded into a mechanical body. One of the most often quoted interactions with the Emperor is from the Master of Mankind, where a group of Sisters of Silence are permitted entry into the throne room individuals who are known as blanks that project a negative psychic aura. The Emperor's ability shouldn't be able to affect them. If anybody could see through his illusions to see his true form, it would be them. Past experience told her that the blinding majesty and stupefaction others felt in the presence of the Golden Throne were wholly absent for Kyria and her sisters. She saw a man on a throne, no more, no less, no radiant halo, no psychic corona, she would have preferred the majestic ignorance. Better to feel everything and see almost nothing rather than stare upon the naked truth. The enthroned emperor was just a man in pain. His suffering etched plain, his mouth open in a silent scream. The agonies he endured for the sake of the species had wrought lines upon his features, somehow bringing the passage of time to an ageless face. We've established that everybody sees the emperor differently, some more dramatic than others. What the sister sees is just a regular guy, one who has had the entire weight of the galaxy, as well as all the hopes and dreams of the species resting on his shoulders for a very long time. Now, this is me just thinking out loud and doing a bit of speculation, so take it with a grain of salt, but I'm not even convinced that the Sisters of Silence saw the real emperor. Much like how psychers have a scale based on their abilities, the same is true for blanks. When a blank encounters a particularly powerful psyker, the Psyker is often able to overcome the Blank's negative aura and still channel their abilities, even if those abilities are admittedly diminished. You can think of it in simple terms of negative and positive numbers canceling each other out. If the scale goes from negative 100 to positive 100, then a Blank at negative 50 power encountering a level 100 Psyker, the Psyker is still going to be operating at around 50% of their abilities. The Emperor is known to be the most powerful psychic entity in the universe. I don't believe there is a blank alive that could overcome the sheer magnitude of his abilities. However, when that particular passage was written, he was already on the Golden Throne, holding back the warp. So it's very possible that she did, for just a moment, get a glimpse at the real man. As to say he was distracted would be a massive understatement. The reality is we just can't be sure, which is okay. That mystery is what makes the Emperor so interesting. And outside of the novels, a few of the authors who have written his character in the past have had some pretty interesting things to say about him in interviews. The first I wanna talk about is an interview that Dan Abnett gave, where he sought to answer some questions about 40K's biggest mysteries. One question in particular was about what the Emperor actually looked like, and he had this to say. The Emperor presents himself like any good god should, in the form that is most useful to him to get across. You think about the Greek gods appearing as rams and snakes and all that kind of stuff because they, you know, they want to pull a fast one or they want to trick somebody or whatever like that. The emperor is the same. He is, what he looks like is unknown to everybody. What he appears as and manifests as is as appropriate to the circumstance. That manifestation, particularly post-Unification War, that manifestation has had to be godlike. It has to be as the Emperor. He has had to command respect. I find it really interesting how he compares them to Greek gods and the way they would take different forms to suit their purpose. This is definitely something that the Emperor is capable of, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's one of the fundamental abilities he used to unite mankind. And speaking of the out-of-universe depictions of the Emperor, when we refer to the books themselves, I think this is actually kind of a brilliant strategy for a character that is written by many different authors, each one of them imparting a little bit of themselves onto the character and that you have an in-lore reason why he would act or speak differently from author to author. Whether this is a brilliant writing strategy or a hand-waving of inconsistencies is something that you'll have to come to your own conclusions on. In fact, leave your thoughts down in the comment section about this because I read all of them and I love hearing what you guys think. And to kind of wrap this video up, I wanted to examine one more interview, this time from a different Black Library author known as Aaron Dembski bowden the author of The Master of Mankind. He talks about how different people view the Emperor, what the point of his novel was, and his thoughts on how people view 40K as a whole. I'll just say this. 
The Master of Mankind is entirely from the perspectives of people that meet the Emperor in pretty specific circumstances. There are obviously other circumstances to come. Nothing in it is definitive, even less so than my usual work. Any definitive statement you can make about how the Emperor sees something or does something is almost always contradicted in the book itself. That's not an escape clause or an excuse, it's the point. Writing him definitively would have been the easiest and most disappointing thing in the world. And on that note, remember, everyone sees 40k differently. What Person X is absolutely certain is the truth of the Emperor, and the best way to present him would be laughed off by Persons A, B, and C. With the Emperor, a lot of interaction is about getting out what you put in. You get what you give. Your perceptions and expectations are reflected back on you, because that's how the human brain perceives everything. A fact that cannot be overstated, the science behind it is fascinating and all important especially when you're talking about someone who exists on that plane of power. At one point, the Emperor makes mention of the notion that he's not even speaking, that being near him allows the conveyance of meaning through psychic osmosis and communication telepathically. He's not even talking. It's raw understanding filtering through a mind or just the way the mortal mind comprehends the aura of what the Emperor intends. Does he only refer to the Primarchs by numbers instead of name? Some characters will swear that he does and doesn't that just perfectly match their perspectives of the Primarchs as either emotionally compromised two human things that think they're sons, or genetic masterworks that have become galaxy-damning screw-ups, leading people to be exiled from their homeworlds. Do you think Sanguinius will agree, or care that that's what mortals think? The Emperor's portrayal on that isn't even consistent between Ra and Diocletian, two of his custodians. And on page one, the only time he interacts with a Primarch himself, and the one and only thing he says to Magnus the Red is Magnus. Like that's a pretty strong indication that the interactions which follow are playing by different rules. Ra sees the warlord of humanity, just a man, but a great one. Weary and defiant, burdened by responsibility, demons see their annihilation and go insane in his presence. One of the knights, as they're marching through the throne room, is caught in a religious rapture, unable to do anything but stare at the glorious halo of the Emperor of Mankind on the Golden Throne. One of the Sisters of Silence, in the same room, literally just sees a man in a chair. Another character, not Imperial, asks a custodian if the Emperor even breathes. She believes he's a weapon left out of its box from the Dark Age of Technology. Only time will tell if we'll ever actually know the full truth about the Emperor. But what do you guys think of all this? Is the Emperor of Mankind one of the greatest fictional characters ever created? Or is he a victim of lazy writing? Do you think we'll ever find out what he actually looks like? What are your thoughts on the Emperor as a character in general? It seems like everybody has a different view of this guy, and I find them all fascinating. So leave your comments down below, and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like and subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell if you want to be notified when I post videos in the future. A big thank you to everyone who watched the video all the way through, and all of you who support me over on Patreon. And with all that out of the way, I will catch y'all in the next one.